to getting to know your neighbor's faith, ask me anything. Um, this evening we have Gloria and Bob Reese from the Church of Jesus Christ Latter-day Saints. This is our third Wednesday of the month. The first Wednesday of each month we have meditations um, with Annie, release into peace with Annie. The second Wednesday of the month we have our monthly meditations and next month we will have Sister Pat Farrell um, from the Roman Catholic tradition. Um, if you are so inclined to make a donation towards the Marine Interfaith Council, our Scott will type in to the chat our website and you are welcome to do so through the website. Um, and next month, well, I'll actually say next next month will be Father John Kokolos from the Greek Orthodox Church with us here um, for getting to know your neighbors. So tonight I'm happy to introduce um, one of our board members and a former board member um, who are a couple. So let me um, tell you a little bit about them. For years, Gloria and Bob moved in the same circles and shared many of the same friends, some of whom were inspired to bring them together five years ago. Thus, without being fully aware of it, they had been moving toward one another for years. It has been a most happy union of themselves and their offspring, Bob's four children and Gloria's six, and their combined total of 19 grandchildren who love one another and are good friends. Gloria and Bob have both been intrigued with other cultures and customs. Gloria as a teacher of English in China, India and Salt Lake City where students from around the globe came to her. And Bob as co-founder and vice president of the Bountiful Children's Foundation, a humanitarian organization that addresses malnutrition among children in 20 countries, from Mongolia to Madagascar and from the Philippines to Peru. He and Gloria have traveled to Madagascar and Guatemala to work with children for the foundation. They hope to travel to the South Pacific this year. They welcome the participation of others in this important work. Gloria's undergraduate work and strong life interest is in nutrition and dietetics. Her graduate work was in cultural communication and communication and aging. Bob just retired as director of the Latter-day Saint Mormon Studies at Gra Graduate Theological Union in Berkeley. Previously, he taught at UCLA, UC Santa Cruz, UC Berkeley, and at a university in Eastern Europe. His areas of specialty include the humanities, the arts, and religion. Bob is also a scholar and writer. His most recent books include A New Witness to the World, Reading and Rereading the Book of Mormon, and Why I Stay, The Challenges of Discipleship for Contemporary Latter-day Saints. Bob gives lectures and presents firesides on a variety of subjects relating to religion and other subjects. Bob and Gloria recently created a new humanitarian organization, Fast Forward for the Planet, which seeks to unite the religions of the world in a monthly fast for the environment. Bob has served in a number of callings in the church, including Bishop, member of the Baltic States Mission Presidency, and University Institute teacher. Together, he and Gloria are part of the church's prison ministry at San Quentin and served together on two Marin Interfaith Council committees. Bob served on the council for five years and Gloria is currently a member. Now I will turn it over to the two of you to tell us a little bit about your faith. Uh, I'm pleased to say that this uh, program, which is called Ask Me Anything, has just been changed for this particular session. It's called now Ask Me Anything Except That Session on 60 Minutes that just aired on last Sunday. Uh, for those of you who watched that, it raised some very interesting questions. Uh, for all of us who watched it, it did. Um, and we'll, I'll just say a few words about that. Uh, one of the things that uh, I've found, I found is I've taught religion and taught Mormonism uh, to Graduate Theological Union and elsewhere as uh, a missionary for the church uh, in the Eastern Europe and also as a 19 year old in the United States. But uh, for a long period of time, there wasn't much that other religions uh, felt that they could have holy envy about. Holy envy means uh, that there are things you see in other religions that you wish were in your own. So uh, one could say that now with a fund of $100 billion, there's something that every religion can envy about Mormonism. 
uh, my attempt at my bad attempt at uh, at humor. Uh, one of the things that seems clear from the fact that the uh, the Latter Day Saints have uh, this much money is that it's a lot of money. As a poet, uh, I'm pretty good with words. I'm not a very good financial manager, but so I had to look up how much is a uh, uh, billion dollars. To put it in language that most people can understand, a million dollars is equal to uh, uh, 32 days. A uh, billion dollars is equal to 320 years. And so a hundred billion dollars is worth a lot of money, a lot of years. Um, the question is how, uh, what is the church doing with this money? How has the church accumulated it? It seems pretty clear from both the, what the church is saying and what uh, 60 Minutes reported and what the whistleblower said is that uh, there was a period of time for maybe 23 years in which the church uh, did not report to the SEC its annual income, that income coming essentially from tithing dollars and from investments on money that the church has had. Uh, that now seems to be clear that the uh, the SEC fined the church for uh, for having uh, 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 perhaps uh, had a different kind of accounting for this money. Uh, how to explain accumulating that much money? I think some people would say the church went through some years, beginning with the early church when it had it lost a lot of money through investments and banking. Uh, it had a very difficult time in the 1890s with uh, the Depression and then the 1930s with the Great Depression. So the church has had some very difficult times managing its funds. And so uh, one of the explanations perhaps is that uh, uh, the church is wanting to make sure that it is able to pay its bills. But $100 billion is a lot of money. And the church is challenged now, I think, to find ways that that money can be spent uh, as it is spending it with humanitarian work and with keeping the church uh, going. But a friend of mine said uh, this uh, 100 to $150 billion represents a great opportunity for the church to set up a global fund that would bless all of the religions of the world and all of the people of the world. Uh, we'll, we'll see what happens with that, uh, that money, but it is a lot of money. Uh, the church has uh, taught its own people to be good stewards of uh, the money they have and to be prudent. And so uh, uh, the, the church now has the challenge of demonstrating that with that kind of largesse, it will do as uh, Jesus was suggesting in his parable of the talents uh, and with his other parables of uh, multiplying the loaves and the fishes to do a lot of good in the world with that money. Gloria? Yes, well, <laughs> I'm inspired by a conversation that uh, Bob and I had with a, a man who is uh, got a wide, broad look at a lot of different religions. This is Pat Coloni, Curloni, and he was asking us, um, he, he said, you don't fit the stereotypes of what we have of Mormonism. And so I think the questions like to hear what your stereotypes are and to see uh, a little bit of that, but um, he also asked us about our heritage. And my parents, my grandparents were here, we were born on this continent, but my great grandparents were born in England and Scotland. And that was in the beginning of the church in the 18, they, it was 1850 about when they were joining, but uh, Bob's were in Wales and he said how did it get across the ocean i thought this was an american church and what did you answer well i said uh, there's a question one of the periods of american literature that i teach is the puritan period and the puritans came to america because they were looking for uh, a new t a new beginning and because there was a great deal of religious conflict in europe uh the the uh, the Anglican Church uh, had broken away from the Catholic Church. There was a, the, uh, 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 a number of churches that began to spring up who were searching for uh, uh, new 
uh, kinds of ways of expressing themselves in turn and finding religious uh, values. So with the, uh, the Reformation, uh, with the, uh, the advent of this, when people came to America, they brought a lot of those religious ideas. And so uh, uh, in 1830 or 1820, actually, a young uh, teenager in living in Western New York by the name of Joseph Smith uh, was some, there was a great, some, this is a period sometimes called the Burned Over District, where there was a lot of religious fervor, a lot of contention among the churches. And he was trying to find out uh, which of all of these churches who were claiming to be true was true. And he was really confused and uh, uh, went to uh, uh, the woods to pray, uh, re reading in uh, the, uh, the Bible that if you have wisdom, ask God. He thought that that was something to do. So that period of religious fervor was one in which Mormonism, or the now uh, known more uh, as the <laughs> Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, had its beginning. And uh, when I've been teaching at Graduate Theological Union, sometimes my students uh, ask me about this period when the church was born. Uh, church came of age in the 1820s and 30s. And uh, uh, one of my students, who was a Lutheran minister, uh, went to over to Stockton to head a Lutheran church. He was teaching at the University of the Pacific and he asked me if I would come over and teach a freshman class of young, bright young students. And so Gloria and I went over and I said to them, I asked them a question. If you were living in 1820, what would you have believed about God? And they said, well, essentially he was powerful. He was punitive. He could be vindictive and uh, he might be capricious. Uh, and punitive. And I said, that was kind of the prevailing idea about God. And what would be, I asked them, what would be your prevailing idea of you as a human being? They said, well, we've fallen, sinful, maybe redeemable, uh, but maybe not, uh, you know, in danger of hell. And I said, those were the ideas that Joseph Smith was confronted with. And when he went into the woods to pray, he had what is called a theophany, which is a an appearance of God, and looking into the heavens, those two ideas that he had held in his heart were challenged by the fact that when he looked into heaven and saw God and Jesus Christ looking back at him, he realized that God was not an angry God. God was not a, 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 you know, a punitive God, but God was a loving heavenly creature. And when he saw the way God was looking at him, he realized that he was lovable. Those two ideas kind of were the beginning of Mormonism, that God is loving and uh, that he uh, is essentially uh, gifting us with eternal life and that we are redeemable. So that was the beginning of Mormonism and that, that message was taken into Europe and elsewhere and that's how our ancestors first heard about it. Yeah, that and was... came and excuse me, came to the United States and many of them were part of the great uh, uh, westward movement of the Latter-day Saints when the Latter-day Saints were persecuted in uh, the United States and found uh, that they had to leave and go to uh, what was called uh, Utah Territory and uh, what was called the Great Basin Kingdom in Utah. Yeah, and on the other point he said was, uh why were they so receptive and i think you've explained that because of the the impact of that message to them in in the european areas but yes. they also were encouraged uh, i mean th this was a, a great commission to go out into all the world that was part of missionary fervor with because of what joseph smith felt and what he was receiving as he, as Revelation for what he was putting together, or you know, uh, understanding. But um, I lost my thought. Let's see. Well, well, one of the things that's clear is that this this idea that somebody had seen God and that God mm -hmm. had said that He wanted to reveal new truth to the world was really a radical idea in 1820. Uh, and shortly after that, Joseph Smith had the uh, appearance of an angel who came to him and said that he uh, was a prophet who had lived on the American continent uh, uh, in uh, uh, 
uh, in, you know, in the prehistoric times, and that he had, uh, that there was a record uh, of written by people who came from uh, uh, the, the Middle East to the Americas 600 years before Christ, uh, and also a, a group that came during the time of the Tower of ba Babel, and they uh, had their own scriptures. Uh, and so the, those scriptures, which were called the Book of Mormon, uh, was uh, it was a new scripture. And in, uh, at this time, uh, almost everyone believed that the, uh, the scriptures were closed, that so there was no open canon, but the Bible contained all of the words of God. And so for religion to say there's, there's new revelation and new scriptures, was uh, was seen as scandalous and so mormons began to be persecuted for for their beliefs and driven from new york to ohio to missouri and to uh, uh, illinois and then finally to the great basin kingdom and many of those converts in europe came to america and that was part of the trouble in nauvoo because it was a larger city than chicago when in, in illinois there and here five thousand immigrants come and um they, there was an extermination order on the lives of Joseph and Hiram Smith brothers, and that happened, I think, within about three months of uh, their this this mass influx. Um, there are many things you might ask about because we, you know, revelation. We have personal revelation that we value deeply. Uh, we have understanding of things as they. We hope, as they are in the world today, we, we need to be very cognizant of that. We, we have a pre-mortal life. I'm just going to name a few things if there are questions. Uh, a mother in heaven is another point of envy that other religions have said. Uh, the purposes of our temples, our manner of prayer, that isn't a set prayer, but it's, it's more of this connection in, in meditation for me particularly. And I want to, would you put up the, the uh, chat box? Uh, I'd like you to look at anyone who wants to. Those are the 13 articles of faith that Joseph Smith came up with in 1870, what was it? 1842, yes. And I'm just going to read the 13th article of faith because I think that that applies uh, very broadly here and, and in, it's part of, what I'm caring about a lot. Tears. <laughs> we believe in being honest, true, chaste, benevolent, virtuous, and in doing good to all men. Indeed, we may say that we follow the admonition of Paul. We believe all things, we hope all things, we've endured many things and hope to be able to endure all things. If there is anything virtuous, lovely, or of good report or praiseworthy, we seek after these things. And so if we were living our religion to the most beautiful, we would be so inclusive. Sometimes we start feeling like we've got the only truth and we get isolationist. But really, that, that is what and we've got a lay church too and so we're not trained in the ministry and yet those are the people leading the church and they get a tremendous amount of inspiration and um, we do ministering uh, just to our neighbors i mean ray lee over here is my ministering sister and anyway what i want to conclude with here is that um, with the idea of eternal progression it doesn't only happen in the next life and we go on, but it happens here and it happens through our humility. And it takes the faith of not knowing things, even though many Mormons say, I know the church is true, but it's a good church. And, and we see things from different um, levels of maturity. And so what we see is very pragmatic, seems like the right thing and the only thing, but then we start engaging our intellect and our intuition more and our connection with God and we start seeing things in a different way and then we start to see the paradox of things and it becomes a much more cosmic way of understanding God and 
Uh, there, Joseph Smith said, by proving contraries, truth is made manifest. And to me, that's not just saying this is good and this is bad, and I can compare them and know that. It's saying, I breathe in. Is that the only good part? But I have to breathe out. <laughs> and many of the seeming polarities, this is where the paradox comes in, where the seeming polarities, we say, is better to, it's better to submit. No, it's better to lead out and control. But you, they have to come together, and they don't mean enough until you put them together. And it's true of so many justice and mercy and um, what desire and aversion. And what I like most is that we are uniquely personal, but we are also universally divine. So when we are this universe, we're, we still have our particularities and our individualities. And when we start seeing the world in this transformative way, it brings all things into one great whole. All truth can be circumscribed into one great whole. That's another um, idea put forth in, in language. And in concept, it is very in, endearing to me. The church is um, uh, a tradition. It's very much a part of the Judeo-Christian religion, but the Book of Mormon says that God has revealed his will to all the nations and people upon the Isles of the Sea. And so Joseph Smith's idea was to bring truth from wherever it could be found and to embrace it. So Latter-day Saints are open to uh, the, the truth and the beauties of all religions and try to uh, uh, try to understand them in a way that uh, that harmonizes with uh, the kind of universal truths. Uh, so there are there are things that are unique to Mormonism, or the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints, as Gloria said. Uh, one is that we all existed before we came into mortality in a pre-existent world, uh, where we were uh, we were one large. Uh, a pre uh, a pre mortal family, and we came into mortality in order to learn how to become like God, and that uh, God sent His Son so that we could have the perfect example of what God wishes us to be like. And so we are uh, Latter Day Saints believe very much in the uh, in the Christian tradition, uh, but embrace also, as I mentioned, ideas from all religions. We believe Mormons have a very unique understanding of heaven and hell. We don't actually believe in hell in the conventional sense. That is, that there will be an eternal punishment and uh, a, a burning, literal burning, but we believe that there is a period of probation in which we all will uh, have an opportunity in this life and in the next to become more godlike. Um, we believe Mormonism is a uh, a, a decidedly optimistic and hopeful religion. Uh, Latter-day Saints uh, are uh, uh, very much centered on uh, the principle of happiness. One of the Book of Mormon prophets said, we lived after the manner of happiness. And Latter-day Saints try to follow that principle. It's a very family-centered uh, uh, religion with a belief in eternal marriage, that marriage is not just something in mortality, but marriage and family bonds can exist in the eternities. And this is one of the reasons we have temples is that's, that's where marriages are sealed for eternity. That's where families are bound together for eternity. And it's, not, raising her. <laughs> it's not just through the ordinances. I think we're bound to each other through our love and our friendship with people here. And it's what I and I know Bob also loves so much about the interfaith community is because it lets us be a little more in touch with the way other people see things because that enriches us so deeply. And we have, uh, we believe that everybody should have the opportunity to embrace the gospel and therefore uh, we have what's called work for the dead uh, in the church. Uh, people, the temples exist so that People can be baptized for those who have passed on, who didn't have an op opportunity to hear the gospel. They have an opportunity in the next world, and we can be baptized on behalf of them. 
marriages and family ordinances are performed on behalf of uh, ancestors, so that the idea of binding together the human family into one uh, great uh, unified whole is part of uh, the work of the temples and the reasons that Latter-day Saints have temples. Um, there are probably a number of other ideas, but I Good don't know whether we probably. have time to uh, for people to ask questions. Well, yeah, let's, why don't we open it up for questions, because um, I'm sure there's some online. I have some for sure. Um, and thank you for sharing um, your very um, heartfelt hmm. faith. So thank I you. appreciate that. It deepen, that deepens my knowledge of, of your tradition. So um, you, in worship, I'm, I'm curious, um, you said it's lay led, uh, but and yet Bob, you were a, a bishop, but it's only a temporary position. And um, are there women who are bishops too? Is it only males, or is it you know how how do you lead the church? Great, great question. Church is a lay has a lay ministry, which means that except for the official officers of the church, which are very few, no one receives the compensation or salary for ministerial work. So I was a bishop at the same time I was a professor uh, and uh, devoted a lot of my time to uh, uh, guiding a, a congregation of uh, uh, 250 single Latter-day Saints. And uh, but that we also have a family congregations. So the church uh, has a lay ministry. The ministry is uh, the, uh, uh, the called ministry or the ordained ministry is males only, but women are given many opportunities to, to serve. Great leaders, there, there yeah. Many leaders in the church uh, uh, are women. There is a women organization uh, called the Relief Society that women serve in, but women have many callings in the church. Gloria might want to say something about that since she's served in many of these callings. Mm. I've served in the Relief Society presidency. I've served uh, in women's president. I've taught classes, the gospel doctrine class. I've uh, been over the activities of award and and we put on road shows when I was younger and, and it's not happening now, but uh, uh, singing events and so forth. But I think Scott's got some more questions here. I was gonna say for all of you online, if you please put your questions into chat. Ah, so, all right. I do have questions. I have numerous questions. But <laughs> um, could you tell us just um, a little bit about the unique uh, sacred writings of the church? So I know there's the Book of Mormon, but I believe there's also some others. Uh, Doctrine and Do Covenants, Doctrine and Covenants Pearl of Great Price. Price. Yeah, you're and good. how they're <laughs> held. Um, and, and yeah, quadruple in the combination and yeah, how they're held, the, 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 the scriptures. The, the church, one of the unique doctrines of the church is the belief in modern prophets and in the belief, belief in continuing revelation. And that is, uh, uh, we don't believe the canon is closed, that it's open. Uh, and that's one of the things my students at Graduate Theological Union uh, say they have holy, holy envy for us. Is that you have uh, new books of scripture. so. Uh, the belief is that there are many sacred books. Uh, I believe that there is truth in all of the sacred books of the religions of the world. Uh, we believe that modern prophets and apostles, that is, we believe in the same organization that existed in the primitive church, and these people are called to receive revelation for the church and revelation for the world, actually. And so, uh, uh, that, that is one of the things that makes the, uh, the church unique. Uh, uh, and also the belief that each person is entitled to revelation. Uh, we are entitled to revelation about our own families. Uh, I'm entitled to revelation about my life. If I have uh, an important decision to make, I pray for inspiration. This is not different from what uh, many uh, churches believe that people can pray and get guidance for. Uh, so. Uh, uh, each each person also is entitled to each Latter Day Saint is entitled to what's called a patriarchal blessing, a particular unique blessing for him or her that conveys something about uh, their uh, their purpose in being in 
uh, in the world and some of the specific things that they might be called to do to serve God and to serve humanity. The church believes very much in service. Uh, and so uh, mm. a great deal of our work is devoted to uh, uh, service. But as a lay uh, uh, a ministry, a lay organization, everyone has an opportunity. There's a person sitting here uh, who was a bishop. Uh, when he was released as a bishop, he and his wife were working in the nursery. And so you can uh, go from being the charge of a congregation to having a different role within the congregation. You can go from being in the nursery to being a bishop. One more thing about the congregation too. Uh, you know, it doesn't matter if we want to go to other churches, but we are in a, a set uh, geographic we don't choose our friends there. We, we learn how to understand people that we might not have uh, sought out before. And it, it becomes a real learning experience in love. Can I, great, can I follow up on sure. something that you said earlier, Bob, just for some clarification, and then we have a couple of questions now in chat. Can you tell us a little bit more about um, the afterlife, just to clarify understanding? Mm -hmm. So does it mean that um, everyone saved? Are there like levels of salvation? Like what is, how does salvation and afterlife work for, for everyone? It's a great question. You, essentially, Latter-day Saints believe in universal, Latter-day Saints believe in universal resurrection and universal salvation. Uh, that means that the concept of heaven differs from that of most uh, uh, Christian religions. We believe that there are, as Paul said, uh, uh, spoke of uh, 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 bodies celestial and terrestrial, uh, celestial, uh, so that the Latter-day Saints believe that there are three kingdoms of glory and that everyone, except for uh, people who absolutely choose evil over good, uh, in this life and in the next, we believe that people who die without having heard about the gospel will have an opportunity both during the millennium and afterwards to hear and embrace the truth so that everyone who's ever born into mortality will have an opportunity, a clear opportunity to choose between good and evil. Uh, we believe that most people, the vast majority, uh, except for the, again, those people who show that they love darkness more than light, which will be a very few people, will be find some degree of salvation, some degree of glory. But Christ said, in my house are many mansions. So we believe that those, those kingdoms are kingdoms of light. And, um, uh, and the, uh, they believe that the highest kingdom or the kingdom of greatest light is called the celestial kingdom, which were, is where God and Christ, where Heavenly Father and Heavenly Mother live. The other kingdoms are also kingdoms of light so that there will be glory for everyone who chooses to, uh, uh, to do, live by light, even if that light is not as great as some people live by even that light. Even if I choose to live light, which is not as great as the light of Christ, I will still be blessed with glory. There's not an eternal burning hell, in other words, or an eternal darkness, except for those people who choose darkness. It's okay, I'll just ask some, keep going with some questions from chat. We have a number of questions. Uh, the first one, uh, thank you. <laughs> uh, the church is now entering its third century. It has changed significantly in the previous two. What is your hope and expectation for this coming century? That's a great question, and I think that would depend on the person. I have uh, uh, I've imagined what the church would be like in 20, uh, uh, 2250 and 2300, uh, and uh, in that imagination, I see many things that the church uh, would be doing and things that have changed. The, the church has adapted to a number of changes. The church has been innovative, uh, still is innovative. The church, I think, sees itself because it believes in continuing revelation, uh, that it is continually has an opportunity to change. I think that the, um, as the church grows, the church is currently growing much faster in the global south in Central and South America, in Asia, and in Africa. So I think the church will become much more uh, dominated in the future by uh, people, the uh, converts from that, uh, those countries. Uh, 
the church is um, uh, the church, like all churches, is somewhat always in a tension between its reflection of current uh, 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 current community and current uh, 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 mores and folk ways and uh, and ways of, of simply living in the world. And so, when the Latter Day Saints went to Utah, they they have very much a uh, a survival mode. One of the reasons why there might be so much money in the church is because the church has, teaches its members to have a year's supply of food. The church teaches its members to be very frugal, to have uh, not spend uh, money foolishly, to have uh, rainy day funds. Uh, <laughs> and so uh, uh, the church uh, expects uh, us to practice them. I think the church in the future will become much more uh, in, in integrated and involved with other faiths. Uh, it will uh, uh, become much more accommodating to social change. The church has seen its changes in the past uh, century and a century and a half much more accommodating to uh, issues like racial equality, issues like LGBT uh, acceptance. Uh, the church has undergone a, a number of changes in it in culture. Uh, and so I think the church currently is in transition as it's always been in transition. Mm -hmm. So That's I think the point that some of, of changing. These, some of these changes mm -hmm. will continue to come. And some of those, some of the, the church believes in both vertical and horizontal revelation. So some of the great changes in the church have come from beneath, from the members pushing for change. Some have come from the top of the prophet has called people to, to make changes. And that's part of those polarities too. We, we want to hold on to certain aspects and we do it in different ways according to how we understand that. But we hold them deep inside ourselves, but we also are open to change and to growth. So some of, some of those changes come by social pressure uh, as Mormons become much more adaptive to their community. Uh, and as they become much more comfortable having changed from that insular society where driven out of the United States, they were very protective and insular. Then they began to going to all the world and Latter-day Saints now are in 132 countries. Uh, it's uh, the Book of Mormon has been translated into uh, well over 100 languages and uh, Latter-day Saint, uh, I think Utah is the a city in the United States with the, the most diverse uh, languages the, the, of the many because, missionaries. because Latter day Saints go out to the world to teach, they learn the language and they come back uh, with that language and uh, very often use it within their own communities. Can I just ask about one change that, that I've heard a story about that I just want to ask? Sure. Um, so, caffeinated beverages mm -hmm. were not. You, originally, you all didn't drink caffeinated beverages. Now it's not, you can't drink hot beverages, but you can drink cold beverages. Well, it's... And, it's, and here's what I heard was uh -huh. because PepsiCo is like uh, one of your businesses, that Mormon church. So that's, that's you know, what the rumor on the street has it. So I was just <laughs> curious. I, I, I don't know the reasoning behind... Be, Hot beverages are not good for you. You can get cancer of the larynx and so forth. But uh, we drink warm hot drinks. Um, it's it's it was designated at that time, and I think it was an issue in the pioneer time, and we've held to that. But it it isn't necessarily the caffeine. But you know how you want to be absolutist <laughs> about some things, and we've realized that that's not the purpose of it. In fact, it comes through from the word of wisdom is part of the doctrine and covenants. And that word of wisdom spends most of the the written material and most of the message is that we eat fresh fruits and vegetables in their season, that we eat meat sparingly, except in times of famine or uh, need, uh, that we um, do things in moderation, and so we've 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 a little bit gone overboard, I think, with the coffee and tea sort of thing. Like, oh, <laughs> it's not so evil, but it's just that it was set forward there, and and we uh, at this point are cognizant of it and respectful. 
Now, the church uh, is known for what is called the word of wisdom, as Gloria said. Oh, the alcohol part. That's The, the Latter-day talking. Saints have for well over 100 years uh, uh, abstained from alcohol, tobacco, tea, and coffee. Uh, the question then came, do that mean all caffeinated uh, beverages? And the church for a period of time said yes. And then within the past uh, couple of decades has uh, said uh, ex- acceptable to uh, eat, drink uh, caffeinated uh, uh, beverages. But the, the church still adheres to no drugs, no alcohol, no tobacco of any kind. And this is one of the reasons why Latter-day Saints are known to have uh, both healthy and uh, uh, long-lived lives. Uh, there's a, uh, the Latter-day Saints have been studied uh, for their, uh, their physical uh, and emotional health. And by and large, the emphasis is on good health, both mentally and physically. Mormonism, or uh, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, has what, <laughs> as I said before, a very optimistic and hopeful religion. Latter-day Saints are essentially, um, I think, happy people. They are subject, just like everybody else, to all of the, uh, the stresses and strains of uh, the modern world. But uh, they tend to be an emphasis is on uh, being uh, uh, responsible citizens, being good citizens, being good parents, good family members, being good workers, being good citizens. Latter-day Saints uh, uh, tend to put a great emphasis on those things. But they do drink Pepsi and and, (laughs) and diet diet, uh, pepper. Uh, Can you tell us a little bit about the, briefly about Latter-day Saints? Good, it's a question. Uh, Why Latter-day Saints? The church is called the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Saints was a term used in the Bible for members of the of Christ's uh, uh, following or his kingdom. Uh, it isn't that we consider ourselves saints uh, in the way that Catholics do. Uh, saints just means members. We are, the, 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 the church believes that the, the original church of Christ was, uh, uh, fell into a period of apostasy and that for long, a long period of time, uh, there was not, uh, uh, there were not prophets and apostles on the earth, uh, and that uh, over uh, over the centuries, uh, uh, that that original those original teachings uh, sometimes were lost, sometimes changed, and so that the church needed to be restored. So that the church believes very much in revelation and restoration, regeneration, uh, reformation, all of those. Uh, those words that uh, uh, amount to a newness and the church uh, uh, and sees itself as, as open to and waiting for additional uh, revelation or light. And so it's, it's, it's the name of the church, uh, but we don't consider ourselves more saintly than other people. More questions? Um, oh, oh, you have more? Oh, yeah, oh, yeah then. Yeah, then. Um, what are the LDS views on social issues specifically? What are the LDS views on abortion and homosexuality? Very good question. I've been, uh, Gloria, you might say something about abortion, but I've been involved in uh, the church and homosexuality for half a century. Uh, for half a Not century. personally. <laughs> <laughs> for half a century, I have been uh, working with the Latter-day Saints yes. and the gay uh, LGBT community as seeking, a bishop, pardon? Yeah. as bishop, tell us. Well, as a yeah. bishop and also just as a, a single individual who, uh, as a scholar, mm-hmm. as somebody who, uh, as a bishop, uh, had a number of Latter Day Saint LGBT people in my uh, uh, congregation, uh, and before that, just knowing that there was this tension between them, so the church uh, accepted uh, uh, the basic. Uh, teachings about homosexuality that were part of the predominant uh, American culture. As a more conservative religion, it was uh, later to uh, really deal with this in what some people might call a progressive way. But the church began a couple of decades ago to uh, have had a website called Mormons and Gays, in which they talked about that. The church, I think, is uh, uh, much more accepting 
of LGBT people, but I think there still is a lot of tension uh, in that. Uh, Gloria and I got a call just the other day from some people saying, uh, we've uh, there's a trans youth in Salt Lake who is homeless. His family kicked him out of their home. Uh, that's a, that's certainly something the church would not approve of, but it's something that happens. That uh, people uh, still see those uh, people, but there there's a less much more enlightenment about it, a much more accepting. The church has a much more uh, affirming a position on LGBT people, but I think there's still a lot of tension in the culture. And I think there are a lot of a number of Latter-day Saints who are working and hoping for more change and more accommodation. Uh, there are a number of organizations uh, kind of uh, within the community that are working for change. Um, was there another part of that? Maybe, maybe on, oh, on abortion. On abortion. Um, it, it's not something that I would do. I mean, it's not, but there are good reasons and the way the political atmosphere is now it's it's really putting a heavy weight on women and where are the men and and where where is their responsibility to these women who then can't work if they've got this child but it, it's more likely that it's a situation where where the mother's health is in danger or um incest or rape, you know, it would be, it just needs to be more compassionate in how we make these laws. And it's the men making the laws predominantly. And the women are rising up and saying, you don't understand where this puts us, what position this is. And for a massive number of states to have this low, number of weeks and and the travel and having to go three and four times if you're anyway it's just um oppressive i think it's a, i think it would be true to say the church has a conservative well, stance on abortion yeah. but it certainly uh, believes that there are exceptions and uh it would probably take the position that uh, abortions have become so available that anyone can get them uh, and right. so uh, their the stance is more conservative but it's not uh, an extreme position yeah i was answering personally he's good enough to be <laughs> good team good yeah team. <laughs> uh and, and you're all also welcome to ask questions so you know more and more but please type in do you have any questions <clears throat> I'll keep going. Yeah. Um, you mentioned preparing for the next life. Can you talk more about that? Yes, that's a great question. Uh, this life is a time to learn how to become like Jesus. This is a, a, a life to, we are, a lot of things believe that we are all born with something called the light of Christ. It's a light that is that all mortals have. And that as we live according to true principles, whether, and I would say whether we're a Buddhist or a Muslim or a Jew or whatever, to live according to the principles of our religion, we can make that light grow brighter and brighter. That means that we become more loving, we become more compassionate, we become more sacrificing. We learn how to do that so that this life is a, a, a time to prepare to meet God. We believe that just as we came from as pre-mortal spirits and from the presence presence of our heavenly parents into mortality that we, we will go back into the, their presence and, and so and we can't we can't take in that kind of light again if we haven't prepared ourselves it would blind us it would it, but if if we have been able to take on that light and to emanate it from ourselves to radiate it um then we're going to have more in common with God and be able to withstand magnificent beauty. Yes, the uh, Latter-day Saints um, uh, have a, um, this concept of a fortunate fall, that, that Eve was enlightened rather than 
give, sinful and giving in to this, that she understood that we have to be in mortality. We have to make mistakes. We can't not make mistakes. The purpose of making mistakes is to learn how to be better. And so that, uh, uh, that, that sin is inevitable because we're all going to sin, but that we learn from our sins and learn from our mistakes and we can become more like God. And as, so that this, 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 mortal, this mortal place is a, is a place to learn to be more forgiving. Uh, we don't look at it as sin so much. I mean, the repentance from that is to turn away. I mean, Christ told the woman in adultery to, to go your way and sin no more. I mean, not, not to do that. So it's a turning away. It's not that you're going to be, um, that's the hellish part that we don't believe in, that, that you're going to be suffering forever because of that. You, you find a new way. Yeah, the idea that it continues that G, uh, Christ said to uh, uh, on the cross to uh, the, the person uh, who uh, uh, saw him as a savior, uh, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Latter-day Saints believe that paradise is a place where we continue to learn that, that, that the whole idea is to grow in light, to be enlightened, to become greater uh, beings of light, and of love and uh and and those things that we associate with god and that we associate with christ and that uh uh that that this so that the emphasis is on change the emphasis on regeneration emphasis on repentance and, and growth, transformation and and to help one another do that in community this is why the the congregation is a is itself a kind of family where we serve one another and help one another and make sacrifices for one another. And we want to. Latter-day Saints believe we we fast one day out of the month. We go for out, without food for 24 hours and we pay the, the cost of those meals to the church to take care of the poor and the homeless. The church spends uh, a lot of money to try and uh, serve humanitarian needs. One of the questions is, couldn't it give a lot more given the fact that it has $100 billion? And I believe that the church spokesman on 60 Minutes said, we are doubling our humanitarian work. And uh, so the, the hope is that uh, that money, which the people sacrifice and give to the church uh, as fast offerings and as tithing, can be used to, uh, uh, to bless others. And for tragedies of nature, I mean, we're, we're there not only with money and supplies and resources, but we're there on our feet and our hands and we're helping in ways that we are able. Um, I have a question, I'm sure you have time still, just um, what about um, divorce mm. in the church? Um, I don't, you're both remarried. I don't know, maybe your spouses died. Or I divorced, I was divorced. Okay. Bob had, So say yeah, a but, little bit about how that works. Cause um, I mean, again, there's a lot of culture that fits. I mean, the church is vulnerable to that too, but I know that Brigham Young was not hesitant to divorce when have people divorce. Uh, it, it, when I divorced, it was in 85, 1985 and it wasn't spoken of very much. It was hard for me because such a family orientation and um, people didn't understand in, in a lot of ways. They'd say, well, what can we do? Have you gone to counseling? Have you done all? You don't understand. This was a courageous act of mine. Just take care of my children. But it's, it's much more understood now. And it's not, it's not a blemish that I feel people are suffering from with it. But it, it, it still needs more understanding and, and more love. My father died when he was 36, I was 11. And I remember people embracing us and taking us in. My mother, they just kept uh, telling her what a wonderful woman she was to raise these six children. I had one person embrace me after my divorce with six children. But it's not that way now, in the same way. I think the church uh, does not encourage. It encourages people to get counseling. It encourages 
uh, people to work hard to stay in, uh, in relationships, but it does not want, and it goes, I think with the church's philosophy of happiness, it does not want people to be miserable. Some relationships simply don't work, uh, and you don't know that until you are in them. So it, it does not, uh, uh, it does not uh, have a prohibition against divorce, but it encourages people to work to try and find solutions to, uh, uh, to marital problems. Thank you. Uh, do we have time or do we have We, we have a couple more minutes and a couple more questions. And, um, I know this could be a long explanation, but we have just a few minutes. Um, could, could you talk a little bit and help understand some of the stories about the hi early history of the church and uh, polygamy or bigamy and kind of how that's held uh, today? Yes, the uh, the, that's a very good question because polygamy was seen with slavery as the twin relics of barbarism. And so Mormons, uh, uh, some of whom did have slaves and some of whom were polygamous, uh, bore that uh, burden, and it's one of the uh, reasons it was seen as so scandalous in the 19th century. Uh, and uh, uh, But Joseph Smith believed that in the restoration of all things included the restoration of the patriarchal order of the Old Testament, so that you had uh, the Old Testament prophets who were polygamous. That was a period of time uh, that lasted probably for about 40 years or so in which people practiced polygamy. And then uh, it came a time when uh, the church was looking for, uh, for uh, state uh, uh, to be entering to the United States as a, uh, a state. And uh, the prophet of the church uh, uh, received, uh, he said, a revelation that polygamy was to be done away with. And so uh, there was a time when it, 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 for some people who were made polygamy, it didn't end immediately. Some people continued with polygamy. There are still people who are called fundamental uh, Latter-day Saints or who, who are, hold on to polygamy, but the church uh, has not practiced polygamy for over 100 years. And, uh, but it was seen by some as a restoration of ancient uh, marital practice. Uh, and uh, it, uh, uh, it still, to some extent, is seen uh, by some people as uh, as unacceptable and uh, kind of, you know, it's, there was a period of time when it was the only thing that Mormons were known by. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so um, it's still, I, uh, I, I taught in Eastern Europe for a period of time and I read some of the uh, encyclopedia entries about Mormonism. That was the first thing that Mormons were polygamous. Uh, but I would say that there are many, many people in the church who are descendants of polygamous uh, uh, families and hold an esteem for those that period of time. But uh, the church does not uh, practice nor sanction polygamous, uh, polygamy at this time. And in the process of that, you answered the other questions. So. <laughs> I'm sure there are more questions than people who have them. There are were available for anyone who wants to, if your question didn't get answered, or if you have another one when you, uh, when this uh, program ends, uh, you can reach Gloria. She's on the uh, um, the uh, Interfaith Council, and she knows how to reach me. <laughs> Definitely. If there are any more questions from anyone online, um, feel free to reach out to us, and we can can put you in contact with Bob and Gloria. So thank you. Um, thank you so much for sharing your faith tonight and answering questions from our community. And thank you for joining us who are here. Um, as I said, next month, we have Father John Kokolas from the Greek Orthodox Church. Um, and then after that, our first Wednesday meditations uh, with Annie. Um, and then Sister Pat Farrell, the second Wednesday of the month, will offer our meditation. So attend all of these. They're, it's wonderful to learn about other churches. Yes, it definitely is. is. So thank you all for being here, and especially the two of you. Thank you, Lynn. Scott.